The Cincinnati Bengals crossed the bridge from expansion team to championship contender in 1973. In only their sixth season of existence, they fielded a team the equal of any, and the entire NFL heard the Bengals roar. Cincinnati spent most of the second half marching up the field, but managed only one touchdown on this 22-yard run by Essex Johnson. However, in the season's first game, Cincinnati lost to Denver. And in the second against Houston, the opening kickoff was returned all the way for a spectacular score. Then for the first time in the new season, the Bengal attack got started. A running of rookie Booby Clark and Essex Johnson, who gained 131 yards, led the offense, and Cincinnati won its first game of the season. One of Sid Gilman's last trades brought Bob Gresham, number 36, from the New Orleans Saints. And Gresham burned the Bengals for 103 yards on the opening kickoff. Gresham was acquired from New Orleans, he ran for over 150 yards in the first exhibition game he played in. Against Cincinnati, he displayed all the abilities of a first-rate NFL running back. Running behind a refurbished oiler front wall, Gresham picked up 87 yards in but 12 carries as Houston gave the Bengals a scare for four quarters. Twice, mistakes denied quarterback Dan Pastorini coast-to-coast -coast touchdowns. A motion penalty wiped out Ken Double O Burrow's 80-yard touchdown strut. Then offsides canceled Pastorini's 60-yard heave to tight end Mac Alston. With 14 points lost, the Houston defense spent most of the game trying to cope with Essex Johnson number 19, who at 5'9 is too small to tackle high. Johnson slithered for over 130 yards and a touchdown as Cincinnati finally wore down the grudging Oilers. Leading 17 to 10, quarterback Ken Anderson riveted his eyes on tight end Bob Trumpy. When Trumpy caught the pass, his eyes read only touchdown. Thirty-four yards later, Trumpy scored, and the Bengals had won their first of the year, 24 to 10 over Houston.
In San Diego, the Chargers faced the Cincinnati Bengals, and every eye was on the Chargers captain, John Unitas, the storied number 19. For this afternoon, in the 209th game of his 18th season, as an NFL quarterback, Johnny U was only two yards short of exceeding 40,000 yards of passing offense in a career. Nearly 10,000 more yards than his nearest rivals, Fran Tarkington, Sonny Jurgensen, and John Brody. On the Chargers' second series with third and 14, Unitas looped this pass over linebacker Bill Berge into the hands of Mike Garrett for a 30-yard gain. And John Unitas had exceeded 40,000 yards passing. By games in, Unitas had completed 15 of 31 for 40,213 yards. And he was working on a record as monumental as Ruth's 714. But this game ball was good enough for the Hall of Fame. For the remainder of the afternoon, the famous quarterback was not treated so reverently by the Cincinnati Bengals. The most effective passing of the game was done by Cincinnati's Ken Anderson, throwing to Essex Johnson, number 19. This 78-yard catch and carry by Johnson gave the Bengals a 7-3 first quarter advantage. In fact, the cat-footed Johnson either set up or scored all of Cincinnati's points. This 20-yard gain early in the second quarter preceded a one-yard score by Booby Clark. But a missed extra point left the score at 13-3 in favor of Cincinnati. In the third quarter, Johnson romped again for 38 yards, bringing his stats for the game to 237 total yards on offense. And that was enough to overcome the Chargers. But late in the game, John Unitas waved his magic arm and showed that some of the old comeback greatness still remained. This 51-yard bomb to Gary Garrison brought the ball to the Bengals' 11-yard line. Three plays later, United speared Bob Thomas in the end zone, giving San Diego a head of steam with a score 20 to 13, and eight and a half minutes left to play. The Bengals' Booby Clark and Essex Johnson devoured the clock, leaving only 47 seconds for John Unitas to work his magic. And that, even for the old master, was not enough time as the Chargers bowed to the Bengals 20-13. to The next week in San Diego, it was the turn of the defense to shine. Legendary Johnny Unitas was the recipient of the Bengals' wrath as six times he disappeared from view under a wave of white. For the second straight week, Essex Johnson starred on offense. He had 237 total yards and scored twice as the Bengals won easily over San Diego. was in Cleveland's huge stadium for the always bitter battle of Ohio. Rookie receiver Isaac Curtis' spectacular catch and run resulted in Cincinnati's only touchdown of the game, and the team lost a close one to the Browns, 17-10. Under azure skies and cool autumnal temperatures, pro football's battle for Ohio is set for Cleveland's Municipal Stadium. With both teams tied for second place in the AFC Central, the forecast called for a typical Browns-Bengals brouhaha. The Bengals struck first, 
as number 18, Charlie Joyner, got place kicker Horst Muhlman within range on this 26-yard catch and step. In the second quarter, Phipps took some uncertain steps to break the 10-quarter touchdown famine that was shrouding his team. Knowing when enough is enough, Phipps took his cue to sit down just in time to let number 37, Tommy Casanova, eat his heart out. Leroy Kelly then followed Gene Hickerson and John Damari down to the Bengal three-yard line. With the home fans in a frenzy, Leroy ricocheted in to make it 7-3 at the half. Cornerback Ben Davis' second fumble recovery of the day set up the next Brown drive that started on the same feet the first one did. With four carries for 52 yards, Phipps showed he could run and still avoid the big crunch. Kelly got the call again and eased into the Bengal end zone to move the Browns out 14-3. For his teammates and fans, it was flashes of deja vu as the 10-year veteran resembled his form of old. Ideas about the Bengals' pussycat passing attack were quickly dispelled when Ken Anderson unloaded a 60-yard bomb to Isaac Curtis. With 9-3 speed and hands like that, number 85 showed why he was the Bengals' number one pick. But last week, his efforts were only good enough to make it close. For the remainder of the game, the Browns showed Ken Anderson some nerve-wracking defense. The Browns boosted the final score to 17-10 behind the artful dodging of Leroy Kelly and Ken Brown to take over sole possession of second place in the rough and ready AFC Central. But the next Sunday, the Bengals really roared against unbeaten Pittsburgh. Terry Bradshaw was sacked four times, and the Steelers managed a meager 67 yards through the air. Horst Muhlman accounted for 12 of his team's 19 points with four field goals. But the big story was the Bengals' punishing ground game, which ate up yards and the clock as Cincinnati upset the Steelers 19 to 7. This bridge over quiet waters leads to Cincinnati's Riverfront Stadium, where the men of steel from Pittsburgh found torrents of trouble. And the person of the Cincinnati Bengals roiled up defense. Terry Bradshaw, the Pittsburgh Steelers' cocky young quarterback, was hassled, hurried, and had by a Bengals defense which descended on him in waves. And when the Steelers did manage to look something like a penthouse team, pressure from the Bengals' rush forced them to make the kind of mistakes which characterize a basement dweller. The Bengals' defense, coupled with some strong special team play, kept Cincinnati on the high ground in good field position. And Horst Muhlman pumped through three field goals for a 9-0 halftime lead. Beginning the third quarter, the Bengals drove 97 yards in 18 plays with number 35, Booby Clark, punching out the key tough yards. As Cincinnati ate up 10 minutes and 48 seconds, 
on their way to Booby Clark's three-yard touchdown run and a 16-0 advantage. In the fourth quarter, Terry Bradshaw hit Ron Shanklin on a pass which was tipped by Cincinnati's Bernard Jackson. Shanklin carried to the Bengals' six-yard line and with the help of a penalty, five plays later, Preston Pearson popped over for a Pittsburgh score. But time had run out on the Pittsburgh Steelers' win streak, and the AFC Central was once again a three-dog fight as Cincinnati posted a crucial 19-7 victory over the Pittsburgh Steelers. The next week, the ground attack again was the difference as the Bengals dominated the Kansas City Chiefs. At this point of the season, the Bengals had won four of their first six games. Some of the so-called experts said that the Bengals had gone to the dogs. But now Cincinnati is huskier and cagier than ever. Last week against Kansas City, all was quiet until Lamar Parrish fielded a punt, shifted gears and took off. Parrish's return set up a play that Paul Brown calls the old Massillon High Special. Bob Trumpy's touchdown gave Cincinnati a 7-3 lead just before halftime. But in the third period, it looked like the Bengals had lost the lead. Mike Sensabaugh's run was nullified, however, and the Bengals took a slim 7-6 advantage into the final period. Twice in the fourth quarter, conference leading passer Lynn Dawson had the Chiefs on the doorstep, but both times they came away empty, once due to a fumble at the one-yard line. Cincinnati put the game away with its running attack for which everybody blocks, including a rookie wide receiver, number 85, first draft choice, Isaac Curtis. Once in the open, number 19, Essex Johnson, could be brought down only by an extremely fast defender with an extremely long reach. For the day, Johnson rushed for 92 yards, but he was topped by his running mate, Charles Booby Clark, who gained over 100 for the second consecutive week and scored the touchdown that enabled the Bengals to defeat a division leader for the second straight game. This week against Pittsburgh, three in a row would give Cincinnati a share of first place in the AFC Central. In a rematch with Pittsburgh, quarterback Ken Anderson completed 20 passes as the Bengals played a fine football game. But on this soggy Sunday in Pittsburgh, it was the Steelers who came up with a big play and Cincinnati lost by a touchdown. Just two games ago, the Bengals had shut down Terry Bradshaw on the Steeler offense in a 19-7 victory. And in the first half of their return, Matt Cincinnati held the upper hand again.
Kenny Anderson's 53-yard connection to Bob Trumpy moved the Bengals to the Steeler 20. But three plays later, Anderson found Essex Johnson, who lost the handle, regained it, and then lost it again. John Rouser recovered Johnson's fumble as heads-up play by the Steeler defense kept Pittsburgh close, trailing 6-3. The Bengals had fashioned their lead thanks to their own heads-up defense as they continued to bottle up Bradshaw. Finally, the Bengals drove Bradshaw from the game when he suffered a broken collarbone that may well have ended Bradshaw's season. But disposing of Terry may have been the Bengals' fatal flaw. For the third time this season, backup quarterback Terry Hanratty's first pass of the game went for a touchdown. This time to Ron Shanklin. Pittsburgh led at the half 10-6. In the second half, Hanratty continued to move the Steelers well, connecting on his second and third passes of the game to set up a field goal and a 13-6 Pittsburgh lead. But on the drive, Terry number two sustained a painful rib injury. And so with the Steeler offense in trouble, their defense went out to get some points. Although punter Dave Lewis got a reasonably good snap, the Steelers were in so fast he couldn't get his punt away and was tackled at his own four. Set up a short Steeler touchdown and a 20-6 Pittsburgh lead. Then the Steeler defense, mainly in the person of safety Mike Wagner, number 23, set out to protect their lead. Three times in the last 20 minutes, Wagner snitched Anderson passes to keep the Bengals off the board. Only once did the Steeler defense falter when Anderson hit Essex Johnson with a 16-yard touchdown pass to make the score Pittsburgh 20, Cincinnati 13. Johnson's touchdown came with seven minutes left, but the Bengals could not get the tie. Wagner's third interception of the day helped the Steelers successfully avenge their only loss of the season. Pittsburgh's 20-13 victory over Cincinnati gave the Steelers a game-and-a-half pad in their division. A cushion they may need with Terry Hanratty nursing sore ribs and Terry Bradshaw possibly lost for the season. Third quarter, a field goal and a 50-yard Anderson bomb to rookie Isaac Curtis cut the lead to 14 points. Next was Dallas, where the doomsday defense continually pierced Ken Anderson's protection and the Bengal offense completely collapsed. Cincinnati's humiliating defeat reduced their record to four wins and four losses. With six games remaining, it appeared Paul Brown's team was already out of the playoffs. The comeback came in Buffalo, but it didn't come easily. In a great defensive effort, the Bengals held O.J. Simpson to under 100 yards. But the game was tied 13 apiece with just three seconds remaining. Then, from the 33-yard line, Horst Muhlman kicked his third field goal of the game, and Cincinnati's victory drought was over. The next four... For O.J. Simpson's team, excitement used to be entering the second quarter before shuffling off its mortal coil and playing dead. But Lou Saban has changed all that. Now there's a combative young offensive line in Buffalo. And O.J. Simpson fans have something to cheer about and more. There's a new miracle ingredient called defense. Top draft picks like number 85, Walt Potulski, are beginning to earn respect. And as the Cincinnati Bengals learn very quickly, these are no longer the buffaloed Bills. The Lou Saban's reclamation program has been trouble at quarterback, where neither Dennis Shaw nor the rookie Joe Ferguson have been able to balance the Buffalo attack.
When number 12, the strong-armed but callow Joe Ferguson took the firing line, the Bengals' Neil Craig intercepted this pass, helping Cincinnati to a 6-3 first quarter advantage on two horse muleman field goals. In the second quarter, Cincinnati's young quarterback Ken Anderson bombed 44 yards to Isaac Curtis, setting up a one-yard plunge by Booby Clark to make the score 13-3. But from then on, the insurgent Bills defense made things tough on Anderson. Two interceptions by number 28, Dwight Harrison, kept the game close. This one set up a 32-yard touchdown run by O.J. Simpson. Simpson's gallop evened the score at 13-all in the third quarter. But for the remainder of the game, a fired-up Bengals defense held O.J. in check. The Bills did not earn a first down in the last quarter, and only once did they manage to cross their own 25-yard line. Still, Cincinnati could not capitalize against the Bills' defense, but they had the advantage of field position. And with three seconds showing, Horace Muleman booted through the concluder, a 33-yard field goal to beat the unbuffaloed Bills 16-13. First came the Jets with Joe Namath on the bench. His replacement, Al Woodall, was continually hammered into the AstroTurf by a devastating pass rush. When Cincinnati put 17 points on the board in the second quarter, it looked like an easy win. But then Joe Namath came off the bench and brought his team back to within a single touchdown. With the ball on the one and time running out, the Bengal defense rose to the occasion and won the ball game. Cincinnati had its second straight victory. The next week against St. Louis, rookie Lenville Elliott, in his first appearance at setback, scored two touchdowns, and Ken Anderson threw for three as the Bengals racked up their highest score of the season, 42 to 24. The Bengals sprang to a big lead last Sunday, thanks in part to the cat-like cruising of number 19 Essex Johnson. And when Essex wasn't on the prowl, his 240-pound running mate Booby Clark was busy gouging out 72 yards in the game's first score. Obviously, Cincinnati quarterback Ken Anderson had his eyes on a 17-0 advantage. And despite a warning by Jet cornerback number 20 Dallas Howell that wide receiver Isaac Curtis was leaving his zone, Anderson was not to be denied. The result was a seam-splitting six-pointer for the San Diego State product Isaac Curtis, who in his first year is one of the AFC's top five receivers. But on the next series, Al Woodall, hitting six for seven, piloted the Jets' 77 yards for the six-pointer to Jerome Barkham. At the start of the second half, Woodall was blazing away again. This time, it was a volley to tight end Rich Castor, 37 yards downrange. Two plays later, the Bengals had themselves a contest as Woodall dropped back and locked in on Castor again, who, with some fast shuffling, was awarded the score. But as the game wore on, despite his 20 completions for 212 yards, Woodall began to wilt under the mauling bingo rush. And the stage was set for the triumphant return of Joe Namath. 
absent since his injury last September 23rd. With a little under two minutes remaining in the score, Jets 14, Bengals 20, Joe started to do his thing. Eddie Bell was the receiver, and suddenly the Jets and Joe Willie were making believers once again. But as close as it was, last Sunday fell well short of the second coming, as first Rich Caster was ruled out on a judgment call. The squabble was just beginning, however, as two plays later it was a Caster controversy once again. A repeat shows just how close a call can get. Was Caster over the goal when he made the reception or not? So much for controversy. When in doubt, there's always one place you can look for sure. In Cincinnati, there was an unfurling of the colors of the old red, white, and blue. And early on in the game, the Bengals unfurled the colors of the old black and blue on the St. Louis Cardinals. Number 19, Essex Johnson, began the day's scoring with a five-yarder for six. St. Louis retaliated with number 44, Donnie Anderson, who rushed for 102 yards and two touchdowns. The first on this pop into the end zone. Ken Anderson went for the quick strike and just missed on this fingertip slider to number 85, Isaac Curtis. With a modicum of razzle and a pinch of dazzle, the Cardinals, too, went for the big one. But good defense by number 34, Neil Craig, snuffed it out. Ken Anderson's theory of try, try again paid off nicely on this arrow to Curtis, and the Bengals led 14-10. Jim Hart's theory of try, try again ran afoul of number 66, Bill Berge, and eventually paid off handsomely for Cincinnati as number 36, Linville Elliott, made it 21-10. Even when pressured, Anderson remained cool and found an outlet in number 35, Booby Clark, a contender for Rookie of the Year honors. The Bengals' rookies continued to shine, and first-year man Linville Elliott took home another six to make the Bulls 28-10. The Cardinals now found themselves in a do-or-die situation, and quarterback Jim Hart went out and did, escaping pressure and hitting number 85, Mel Gray, who made an excellent reception. Hart continued to travel the air route and came up with an amazing bit of luck to number 21, Terry Metcalf. Hart then went to his tight end, Jackie Smith, who was very wide open, deep in the Bengals' secondary. From there, Donnie Anderson gouged out his 13th touchdown of the year to lead the NFL, and St. Louis trailed by nine at 35-24. 
But fighting for a playoff spot, Cincinnati wasn't about to let this one get away, and Anderson to Bob Trumpy salted it. Bengals 42, Cardinals 24. With a record of 7-4, and four, the Bengals were within one game of first and faced the powerful Vikings. Fran Tarkenton spent much of the day watching the Bengal offensive front overwhelm the Purple Gang as the ground troops controlled the game. Cincinnati's keyed-up defense literally leveled the Viking attack. They allowed nary a single point, and on a fumble recovery, scored six themselves to beat Minnesota 27 to nothing. In perhaps the most important victory in their history, the Cincinnati Bengals had propelled themselves from the anonymity of a 500 record to first place in a single month. The upset of the Vikings was a big win. The marked contrast between the two clubs last Sunday wasn't difficult to discern. The Vikings were lighter than air. And the grim-faced Bengals were prepared to fight for their playoff lives. Even Bud Grant had a certain swagger of overconfidence about him. Meanwhile, Paul Brown couldn't have been more intense and it all added up to a Cincinnati victory of record proportions. So emphatically did the Bengals bust the Vikings that for the first time in 162 games, the Minnesota machine did not register a single point. The Bengals defense held the Vikes to 81 yards rushing and they did it with a thing called emotional frenzy. It got so bad, Minnesota let Bob Berry come in and direct the Viking attack. But ball hockey linebacker number 66 Bill Berge intercepted and returned 39 yards to set up a horse Mulman field goal. There were big hits all day as the Bengal defense intimidated the Viking offense. Ed Marinero coughed up the ball and number 20 Lamar Perry scooted in with it for six. But as effective as the defense was, so too did the Bengal offense rise to the occasion as Ken Anderson and company rolled up 321 yards of total offense. Taking fast advantage of a Bill Berge fumble recovery, Essex Johnson burned the Vikes on a 40-yard draw. And while Essex Johnson was slashing and twisting for yardage, behemothly proportioned Booby Clark was steamrolling as usual. Clark's 26-yard burst set up the last Cincinnati score in which quarterback Ken Anderson found tight end Bob Trumpy all alone in the Viking goal. A repeat of the play reveals the excellent protection afforded Anderson by his offensive line and the solitary figure of Bob Trumpy in the corner of the unattended Viking goal. For the Purple Gang, the humiliating 27-0 defeat raises the inevitable question concerning their true championship medal. And for the triumphant Bengals, the victory catapults them into the heat of a three-way tie for the AFC Central Division. For Cincinnati's next opponent was arch-rival Cleveland, also in the thick of the Central Division race. This was a game both teams had to win, but the Browns never had a chance. The orange and black defense swarmed over Mike Phipps and his teammates all afternoon. Offensively, the presence of number 18, Charlie Joyner, returning from a season-long injury, opened things up for Isaac Curtis. Curtis and Ken Anderson team for three picture-perfect touchdown passes to beat Cleveland.
Cincinnati's fifth straight win was a special victory for two reasons. They had decisively overcome the Cleveland Jinx by eliminating the Browns, and they all but assured themselves of their second division title in four years. The Cincinnati Bengals, not the Cleveland Browns, would be in the playoffs. Last week, the Queen City of Cincinnati was the focal point in the NFL's tightest divisional race. For the hometown Bengals, there was only one way to win a division title. They would have to defeat their arch rivals, the Cleveland Browns. It should come as no surprise to anyone that here at season's end, the Browns are again factors in the title chase. Somehow, they seem to do it every year. This season in particular is an odd one for Cleveland, for they are winning with defense. For the Browns, offense traditionally carried the load. An offensive line beset by injury and age has been the main problem for Nick Scorich. The running attack is no longer consistent and can be counted on only for an occasional big play. The passing has been weak and Mike Phipps spends more time dodging tacklers than he does searching for receivers. The biggest bright spot has been exciting Greg Pruitt, Cleveland's number two draft choice. A more painful fact is that the team's two number one picks have barely contributed. Sure starter Pete Adams, a guard, was injured in preseason and hasn't played at all. And Steve Holden, a potential superstar, has yet to catch his first pass in the NFL. Cincinnati had a chance for Holden, but passed him up for Isaac Curtis. Curtis has been sensational and has given the Bengals the deep threat they have lacked throughout their short history. A big surprise has been Booby Clark, not drafted until the 12th round. Teamed with Essex Johnson, the Bengals may emulate Miami in having two 1,000 yarders on the same team. For Paul Brown, the man who founded and named the Browns, this game is the most vital in a long and extremely successful 39-year career. So for these arch-rival Ohio teams, today is the day. Effective line betrayed him on another. Phipps would be sacked five times today. Last week against the Chiefs, he went down seven times. And so it's gone all year long. Luckily, Phipps has a strong body to go with his strong arm. Fall, they began a march that would set the tone for the first half. Quarterback Ken Anderson consistently threw under the Brown zone for short, successful gains to Charlie Joyner and Isaac Curtis. Joyner has been hurt most of the year and having both wide receivers together would be a big factor in this game for Cincinnati as they picked up gains of seven, nine, nine, and nine yards on four consecutive short throws. Then, for variety's sake, Essex Johnson squeezed through a small opening for short yardage and a respite for the passing game. But from the nine, Anderson hit on his fourth nine-yarder of the drive, a pass Isaac Curtis took all alone for a touchdown. Cincinnati had drawn first blood. A repeat shows that Anderson never looked anywhere but in the direction of Curtis, who had gotten behind Clarence Scott. Cincinnati 7, Cleveland nothing. Two plays later, Isaac Curtis simply outran Walt Sumner, and the Bengals had their second touchdown. Curtis, who was probably the fastest man in pro football, had gone 70 yards to stun the Browns and thrill the fans. Cincinnati now led 14-3. For the remainder of the half, Cincinnati's tough defense just took off on the Browns' attack. 
led by Bill Berge, who always plays best against Cleveland, the defense stopped the run and constantly forced Phipps to abandon his passing plans with a fierce all-out rush. The young man from Purdue was equal to the challenge, however, and made some long gains because of the Bengals' exuberance. He paid for it too, however. Long ball threat, and always seems to make incredible catches against the Bengals. Phipps tried their other wide receiver, Fair Hooker, but the Bengals covered well to end Cleveland's last threat of the half. Fell earlier, and the team moved downfield. Then from the 20, Anderson worked on rookie safety Van Green, and Isaac Curtis came open for his third touchdown catch of the half. On each one, he had beaten a different defender. Cincinnati's choice of Curtis over Holden in the draft couldn't have looked better as the Bengals dominated the Browns 21-3 as the half ended. At the start of the second half, Anderson, who had found 169 yards of success in the air in the first half, continued to find cracks and crevices in the Cleveland zone. Working repeatedly to the left side of the Cleveland defense, Anderson found Bob Trumpy for 14 yards and got 18 more with Charlie Joyner, who got behind linebacker Bob Babbage, number 60, and slid safely into home. With Anderson already over 200 yards passing for the day and the Browns highly pass conscious by now, Anderson used the draw play and Essex Johnson got 16 yards, almost breaking it for the touchdown. Tom Darden's shoestring tackle saved the touchdown, and a repeat of the play reveals that Darden was indeed the last man with a shot at Johnson. It would prove to be a big save, as Anderson handed off to Booby Clark three straight times, and Clark rang up a first and goal from the three. But the Browns made Darden's saving tackle stand up when they refused to yield the touchdown. After a run gained down to the one, Anderson tried to pass, but John Garlington blitzed him into a hurried incompletion. A third down run failed, and so Horst Newman was called in. His field goal boosted the lead to 24 to three, but the Browns were desperately searching for inspiration and drew it from the defense's gallant goal line stand and got back into the game. Cincinnati's next possession, however, would prove to be the game winner. Where others may have folded before the Browns' sudden strike comeback, the Bengals, now a big game toughened team, did not. Passing sparingly and relying on his running game, of which he himself was a part, Anderson drove the Bengals to the Cleveland 37-yard line. But here the Browns very nearly created another big break when Clark fumbled. Clark recovered his own fumble, but on a repeat, we can see that he was lucky to do it. The football, usually known for its weird bounces, for some reason stopped dead, and Clark found the football staring him in the face. It was a big break, but nothing in comparison to Anderson's next pass, which saw Clifford Brooks bang into Charlie Joyner to bring up first and goal from the one-yard line. Joyner got the call he was looking for, and though the Browns argued vehemently, there was little doubt that Brooks had interfered. But it was perhaps the biggest play in the game, and the Browns found the penalty a bitter flag to swallow. On the next play, Booby banged over right guard, and the Bengals again led by 14. covered fair hooker was intercepted by Bernard Jackson
Jackson was down on the Cincinnati six-yard line, but he couldn't resist showcasing his moves. The Bengals were again in the shadow of their own end zone and stormed in. Phipps fumbled, and when Royce Berry recovered, the Browns' gut comeback was all but over. They seemed to sense it, and the emotion-drenched game left some of the players a bit testy. Clock. Cincinnati moved toward the clinching field goal. Horst Newman hit it, watched it fly true, and gave the victory salute, and went to kick off, confident of the Bengal defense's ability to hold off the Browns. Cleveland would have two more possessions. The first ended with Phipps sacked by Mike Reed and Royce Berry for a 13-yard loss. Cleveland's playoff hopes were just seven minutes away from disappearing almost completely. Holden, his first catch of the year, overthrew, and Ken Riley intercepted. Bernard Jackson enjoyed Riley's interception immensely, as with just two minutes left, the Browns, the Bengal nemesis on so many occasions, had finally been conquered. Now only the Oilers stood in the way of a division title, and while Houston proved surprisingly stubborn, the Bengals came on to win. For the second straight week, Ken Anderson threw three touchdown passes, and for the second straight week, Isaac Curtis was the prime instrument of destruction. Curtis gave an extraordinary performance. Though the margin was narrow, the Bengals had earned their sixth straight win in the AFC's Central Division title. Beginning the season, Paul Brown predicted that his Cincinnati Bengals were ready to make the big step from respectability to excellence. But all year long, the Bengals seemed to be on the verge of a mediocre season. But now, having taken two steps forward after each setback, Brown's Bengals needed just one more victory to recast the coach in his accustomed role of genius. And with the Houston Oilers, the only remaining obstacle, the Bengals' second division title in the tough AFC Central, seemed assured. But from the beginning, it was apparent that the lowly Oilers intended to make this afternoon a memorable one for Paul Brown and the Bengals. The Houston defense turned truculent and stopped both Booby Clark and Essex Johnson short of their 1,000-yard season. And by the end of the first quarter, the Bengals could manage only a 3-0 advantage on an 11-yard field goal by Horace Mulvin, set up by this Houston fumble, which was eventually controlled by Cincinnati's Jim LeClaire. Late in the quarter, ex-Bengal running back Fred Willis, number 44, turned on the Houston attack with this 25-yard rush. 
And beginning the second period, Willis covered his own fumble in the Bengals' end zone, and the score read Houston 7, Cincinnati 3. But the newest ingredient in the Bengals' offensive arsenal, the bomb to Isaac Curtis, quickly puts Cincinnati back on top 10 to 7. It has, in fact, been the bomb to the long-striding rookie Isaac Curtis, which has carried Cincinnati through the final weeks of the season to the doorstep of the playoffs. And remembering the Otto Graham era, it is not surprising that the conservative Paul Brown has found the big play in time to spark the Cincinnati attack. Beginning the second half, Ken Anderson found his tight end Bob Trumpy for this 10-yard touchdown, making the score 20 to 10. And the Bengals appeared to have quelled the Oilers' hopes for the upset. And this spectacular by Isaac Curtis appeared to be just icing on the cake, wrapping up AFC Rookie of the Year laurels for Curtis as well as AFC Central Honors for the Bengals. But at the top of the last quarter, Dante Pastorini threw the Oilers' offense into high gear. Sparked by the determined runs of Fred Willis and number 18 Paul Robinson, another ex-Cincinnati ball carrier, the Oilers drove for two touchdowns, making the score Cincinnati 27, Houston 24. But the Oilers' rally only served to make the game interesting as Cincinnati held on to their 27-24 advantage making Paul Brown's preseason prediction come true. Despite the white handkerchiefs, the Bengals weren't about to surrender. Number 19, Essex Johnson, went up the middle for good yardage. But the Cincinnati star was star-crossed this day as a clean hit caused him an injury to his knee that finished his effectiveness for the game. However, his run helped get Cincinnati on the board with a field goal. Gracie tried to counter by returning to the airways. But then a flash of black and orange homed in, stole the pass and blitz 45 yards to put the Bengals back in the game. A repeat shows that number 34, Neil Craig, had to play red from the start. And his score not only brought his team to within 11 at 21-10, but it also lit some fires. Number 18, Charlie Joyner, had his flame almost snuffed as he made a great catch despite some concentration wrecking. A repeat of the play certainly makes you wonder how Joyner ever managed to hold on, but he seemed unfazed by it all. Ken Anderson added his share to the Cincinnati resurgence by scrambling his team close enough for another horse Muleman field goal to trail at only 21-13. Then, on the next kickoff, Mercury Morris couldn't find the handle, and the charged-up Bengals special team recovered the ball. Although the touchdown by number 55, Jim LeClaire, was no good, the Bengals got another field goal, four seconds before the half ran out, and what had begun as a Miami romp 
had now become a 21-16 thriller. Demonstrated as seen when Miami attempted an uncharacteristic act of deception. Tommy Casanova took this one away from Warfield, but the Bengals' offense sputtered to a halt. The Miami offense, however, was a case study in execution. As in the playoff against the Dolphins, 80,000 waving white handkerchiefs signaled the end of the Bengals' great season. The loss in the Orange Bowl could in no way diminish the fact that Cincinnati's season record of 10 wins and 4 losses was the best in their short history. Only three teams in the entire NFL did better. Indeed, there was much for Bengal fans to cheer.